Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for the invitation to, uh, to speak today. So we've been discussing adjuncts, imaging adjuncts to peg placement. These are my disclosures. So sometimes we get called for uh, for the Friday afternoon console in terms of do you have uh, do you have some time for a quick peg, uh, and a lot of times we get uh, drawn into a situation where you know we weren't quite clear, you know quite clear exactly what the uh, previous surgical history is, but a lot of times in these patients who have significant uh, surgical histories, we do we do still have the ability to really treat them uh, endoscopically and as minimally invasively as possible uh, with the help of some additional imaging. And the reason why you do obviously want to try to consider uh, additional imaging in these situations is that, as we know, there are still complications uh, associated with placements of a peg, some of them being major complications. Obviously, one is being uh, peg placed through the colon and uh, 3 to 8% of the time. And of course, the minor ones still consider about 14%, obviously, in terms of, uh, of leaks. But overall, the objectives of, the, of this uh, discussion is really to look at some options that you have, such as laparoscopic assisted, CT assisted, ultrasound assisted, and then fluoroscopy or colonoscopy, which is really uh, done uh, concurrently. So when is adjunct, when is adjunct imaging required? <clears throat> Excuse me. Previous gastric surgery, uh, such as a previous sleeve gastrectomy was performed. Also, if you have failure of transillumination, which is obviously one of the one of the tendons of placing a peg, um, that is often becomes an, uh, difficult to to, uh, to see and to observe in patients who have significant obesity. Obviously, overlying colon, if it is known on previous CT scans, the adjunct uh, imaging and, and methods can be useful. And of course, a recent abdominal surgery as well, uh, the imaging will help you get a, a much safer, uh, safe track to place your peg. So one of the more commonly used uh, techniques is a lap-assisted peg. Uh, currently, the, the way I will perform this is really the use of, of one, uh, sometimes two placements of five millimeter ports. I do enter it into the abdomen using a varus needle as well. And in most situations, I will use T anchors to pexy the stomach up. One of the benefits of doing this laparoscopically in these situations and putting another five millimeter port is the fact that you can grab the stomach and bring it up to the anterior abdominal wall and you can see if there's significant tension there. A lot of times if there is significant retention uh, or, or recoil of the stomach to, against the anterior abdominal wall, and that in those cases, I may actually just place a, uh, a suture pexy and in some of those situations, you may have to upsize one of the five millimeter ports up to a 12 millimeter port in order to more easily pass your needle uh, in and out of the ab wall. So this is a patient with an LVAD. I've, uh, at our institution, I've cornered the market on uh, LVADs and PEGs, I'm proud to say. Uh, so you can see, <laughs> so you can see uh, some of these arrows, yeah, some of these uh, options here, you can see some of the red arrows indicating the drive line. So some situations where, I, you know, in this particular case, I feel like I do have a very large window in the left upper quadrant to go ahead and just place a peg uh, without any other additional imaging. However, in this situation, again, uh, it, this, this preoperative CT imaging, one tells me exactly what the drive line is, so I can actually trace it out preoperatively. Um, and certainly, certainly this helps when you can't really palpate the drive line. But also, um, it gives me a nice big window and I can tell where I can safely get in my barrier needle to insufflate. I will always use a scope and a lap-assisted lap uh, technique in these patients. The reason why, again, is I want to make sure that that stomach is pexied well to the abdominal wall. Um, again, if there's good recoil, if I have to really push the, pull the stomach down uh, below the rib line and there's recoil, I will pexy pretty significantly. If the peg falls out or is pulled out, um, obviously there's going to be significant morbidity uh, with these patients. So this is one situation where we entered in the left upper uh, abdomen using a varus needle. We insufflated the abdomen. Um, there was some anterior uh, adhesions to the anterior abdominal wall, uh, which we easily bluntly dissected. So here you can see that I'm going to go and I grab the stomach, bring it up to the anterior abdominal wall to see if there's significant tension and there wasn't. And obviously you can also desufflate well below 15 millimeters of mercury uh, in order to, uh, to go ahead and place your peg. And then at this point, once I have direct visualization uh, and I'm happy that I can use T-anchors for further peg seats, really just go, you know, you just go ahead and play, place a straightforward peg. Um, the way I will pass my peg tube down uh, first, and then what I do is I just push the bumper in a little bit more into the intraluminal area. And then you can see on the right side, it's just kind of uh, just basic uh, T anchors are being utilized uh, to further complete into pexy my, uh, my uh, stomach to the interdominal wall. And then on the, uh, on the left side, you can also see at this point, we've placed multiple uh, T anchors, and then we really just pull that straight up to the anterior abdominal wall. And again, these patients with other previous cynical histories, such as LVAD, you, you really don't want to have any 
if this peg gets pulled down in the middle of the night, you want to know that you're fairly certain that you can either go down and do, you know, just redo another peg or, you know, call your IR friends if they want to just go ahead and put a, a wire and a new peg a tube in. The, the stomach is well adhered to the anterior abdominal wall. So the next modality is a CT-assisted peg. This is a commonly known as more percutaneous radiologic gastrostomy. It's not as commonly done, um, but again, you can use it for if you have an inability to transluminate endoscopically. More important, more commonly, probably more often used for obstructing head or neck lesions or cancers. And again, obesity and hostile abdomen can certainly be used as well. Pretty simple, straightforward technique. It utilizes CT scans done by radiology primarily. Uh, most of the time, they will place an NG tube down into the lumen of the stomach. They'll insufflate it up. They'll go ahead and pass a needle into through the anterior wall into the stomach, and then they'll go ahead and just perform. Uh, they'll dilate the tract, uh, do push maneuver, and they'll place their uh, the peg in using utilizing this manner. But also, you can also perform a combination of the procedure. You can have two teams available, one being endos uh, you know, your endoscopic or surgical team, and then second, you can also have your radio, uh, radiology team as well. You, can bring, you have two, a few, few options in this situation. You get the patient on the CT scan, you perform a CT scan, you can even place your, your, uh, your gastroscope down to the stomach, and you can perform your usual maneuvers uh, in terms of uh, insufflating the, the stomach, see if you can transilluminate. You can take your imaging at this point, and if you have a clear track, you can go ahead and just complete the peg uh, in standard fashion. The other option that you can have as well is you can really perform a rendezvous technique where the radiologist will place a needle and a wire under direct visualization into the stomach. You simply grasp the wire, pull it up, and then you can also at this point go ahead and just perform a standard, uh, standard peg. The, probably the biggest drawback of this uh, technique is the fact that you do have to have two teams available at the same time. But what's nice about this technique is if you don't have a surgical team available, the radiologist can go ahead under CT guidance if they want and just put a, a, a needle in. You, uh, you get some good duct tape. You, uh, you, you, you put a wire in. You tape that wire down shut. And when your surgical team is available, they can go in and do a delayed rendezvous technique as well, which is another option, uh, again, if the two teams are not available concurrently. Now, one other, uh, what I feel is really an underutilized uh, method for peg placement is ultrasound. And again, same, same issues, you fail to transilluminate, can't get a safe tract, but you can utilize transcutaneous ultrasound to really avoid any significant abdominal visceral injury, uh, such as to the colon. Shaman uh, published uh, his a small series, uh, and we need to look at 15 patients. Now, these patients, the 15 that he evaluated for uh, placement utilizing ultrasound, had already failed endoscopic management. He took him back to the OR and he attempted with a ultrasound guidance and he was su successfully placed 14 out of 15 of the pegs utilizing ultrasound. Now this is pretty significant because considering the other option would be either other some type of modality or even surgical placement, 93% of these patients uh, did not have to go for any other significant uh, uh, procedure. They did, again, utilizing the ultrasound. And this situation is another one uh, published by Meraki as well. And he looked at 22 patients who, again, had failed previous standard peg placement. And you can see pretty nicely the organs. If you look at the, the left side, the sagittal picture, um, the arrowhead itself on the left, an A, demonstrates the colon. And you can see on the actual arrows, you can see the stomach. Uh, image number, uh, image number, letter B. <laughs> You can see on the uh, on the axial view, you can see the stomach pretty clearly there. You can see the colon on the left side with the arrowheads as well. And you have a straight shot. And at this point, you can really just go in, put a needle, put a wire. You can already have a, an endoscope down as well where you can grab the wire and just go ahead and, and, and uh, perform a standard peg. So pretty pretty nice anatomy. And again, I do think it's uh, probably something that could, we can really, uh, really evaluate further and see if we can kind of... Uh, increase the use of ultrasound if it can limit some of our uh, some of our uh, injuries. Now, also another option you have is colon assisted peg, and this is kind of done concurrently with uh, with fluoroscopy as well, usually done in the operating room. Colon injury is obviously one of the more common uh, injuries, and we say common, but again, if you look at the incidence of it, it's pretty pretty significantly low, which is good. But again, they do come with significant morbidity, so obviously, if we can eliminate them even further, um, that would be uh, obviously be ideal. And in this situation, um, you're really going to utilize two scopes, one from above, one from below. Uh, you're going to go ahead and, and if you look at, uh, if you look at uh, image A there, uh, you're going to see the fact that there's a significant amount of colon overriding uh, the stomach. 
If you look at B on the axial view, the arrow demonstrates the uh, stomach itself, and you can see that it's pretty significant. You have no safe track at all. So when you place the two scopes in, um, you're gonna have two, two options uh, that, you're gonna be, that you can utilize. One is the fact that if you get a colonoscope up in, uh, up in, the, distal, in, the, in the colon itself, if you're lucky enough and you can simply do the decompression, if you can get a clear window, um, then you're obviously you can move ahead, uh, move forward with placing your peg in the standard fashion. The other option is under fluoroscopy, is if you look at uh, the image on the far right here, um, you can see that this uh, colon, transverse colon is filled with contrast, scope is in position. You can maneuver the scope on using fluoroscopy to, in order to pull down the colon well below the, uh, the uh, gastroscope and at that point create a window for yourself as well. Now again, this is a little bit more of a refined, you know, a little more experienced teams. You have to have, uh, you know, two surgeons who is comfortable doing both colonoscopy as well as upper endoscopy. Uh, this is another, just a few more images as well. And, and a lot of times, the way to position these patients is you're going to place them supine. Um, you want to split leg uh, approach, and so in order you can access from below as well as from above. So this is a pretty nice image here on the far left. You can see the, uh, you can see the, the light there, which is the uh, colonoscope. And then if you look at Im uh, image F, uh, at this point, uh, we've uh, outlined the stomach. And you see you have a nice wide open window. The colon is well down. Now what's also really, what's a nice you know, advantage of this procedure itself is the fact that after you go ahead and place your, uh, place your sheath and place your wire, you should go back, at, you should stop, pause at this moment, go back and evaluate the colon using a colonoscope to ensure that you haven't gone through the colon at all with the wire. Um, if you did, you pull it out, you're gonna avoid the dilation and placement of the peg. So it's a pretty significant uh, advantage using this procedure. This is just basic setup uh, for the room. Uh, if you look at the, uh, on the left side, the head of bed is uh, at about six o'clock. For us, we monitor is distal to us. Uh, upper endoscopy on the left, C-arm, and a lower endoscopy to the right as well. And then the image on the right side just gives another, another uh, schematic how you can set up the room. But again, the easiest way is obviously supine patient, split leg approach. Thank you very much for your time. Any questions? <laughs>